it is the tradition of the University of Western Australia to acknowledge that this university, situated on Noongar land, and that Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. Welcome to this evening's lecture. My name is Dirk Seller. I'm a professor of marine conservation and the director of the Sea Around Us Indian Ocean here at UWA. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Rashid Sumaila, who is professor and director of the Fisheries Economics Research Unit at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I don't know how much to tell you about Rashid, but maybe it suffice that I tell you that he's a uh, widely recognized and highly published and highly cited fisheries economist. And, well, shall I mention the number? The last count, which might be a little while ago, he had well over 230 papers, over 60 books and book chapters. Personally, I've known Rashid for 20 years now, which kind of tells you how old I am. But I had the opportunity to work with him repeatedly over these years, and I have an ongoing collaboration with him. And it's always a pleasure to work with Rashid, because every time I do, I learn something new. And that's why I like being an academic. Rashid specializes in bioeconomics, marine ecosystem evaluation, and the analysis of global fisheries issues, such as fishery subsidies, IUU fishing, which stands for illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, and also in the economics of high seas fisheries and deep sea fisheries. Rashid works all over the world, North America, Europe, West Africa, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia. Wherever you go, you might find work that he's doing or has been doing, or will be doing. He's a for global economic citizen. So I'm very grateful that despite his very busy schedule, he was able to come and join us for a couple of days and to present tonight's lecture on how to achieve a sustainable blue economy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me for coming to the smile. So yeah, thanks. thank you so much for the introduction and uh, I want to thank the university for getting me here. It's always a privilege to get to share uh, not only my work but those of my colleagues and collaborators and also other scientists around the world. So uh, it's a pleasure and I want to thank you all for making time to come here today because I know as an economist I know the value of your time. <laughs> the opportunity cost of your time is very high. There are tons of things you could do with this one, or oh, you decide to share it here with me, and I'm grateful for that. So, I've planned something, I want to make this more lively. So, you will hear a video, it's an interview, a short one at the beginning. Then I talk about a few things, and then I'll end up with another uh, with a video, right? So, it's audio, video, and me and myself talking. So, that hopefully, there's something for everybody, huh? So, that is. Uh, uh, the modern academic has to do all this, this, this. You don't just publish and keep your papers on your shelf. And when you go to sleep, you have to share it with the public. So, the blue economy has been uh, a huge thing uh, recently. People are talking a lot about it. In November, uh, Canada, Kenya, and later Japan joined actually organized a huge conference in Nairobi that took place in Nairobi. And there were 17,000 people who attended. So there's a lot of interest in what is called the blue economy. And I think this is because people, almost everybody, we want to have a reasonable good quality of life, whilst at the same time we don't want to destroy the environment. I think I can say that for every human being. It is when the robber hit this the road when it comes to your livelihood, that is another story. But in general, people subscribe to it. And the blue economy is partly about doing that, in my interpretation. So this is the, the model that is going to guide the talk. So to me, blue economy actually means you have to think about the people and the ocean. You have to think about the environment and people and how to make them work together in harmony. Right? You really have to find a way. And that's a struggle for you. For you all struggling to achieve is difficult, so how do we do that? And the way I think we can achieve this is actually to find a way to make our relationship with people and on the ocean
approaching or the environment in general in such a way that there is a positive feedback that goes from people to nature. And uh, not a negative feedback. And I will explain this more and more as we go. Essentially, I'm going to use climate change, some of our work on climate change, on subsidies, fishery subsidies, as the government giving taxpayer money to the fishing sector for all sorts of reasons, and also how we manage the high seas, which is a part of the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, 200 nautical miles away from any coast that is called the high seas, that is area that does not belong to a coastal country. How we manage that also comes into play. So these are key things. You want to have positive feedback, not negative feedback. I can tell you that in most cases, the way we deal with these three and many other things, the actions we take and the policies we put in place actually lead to negative feedback from people to nature and nature to, to people. And I will slowly get to that. Now, before we get into this, it's really important to note that the ocean is really too large to mess up. It is 70% of our world, actually. So think about it. Uh, many of us, before you get into this room, you've gone to school. If you kept on scoring 30% in your exams, you wouldn't be here, right? Anytime you mess up 70% of anything you care about, you are in trouble. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it's too big to mess up. So uh, that's why uh, many of us spend our uh, life thinking of how to make our ocean sustainable. And another reason is actually that the oceans are crucial and important for so many people around the world. It is food for millions. It is recreation for many. It is carbon absorption. There's so many things that the ocean does for us. Uh, the popular one is that half of the oxygen that is generated in this world is done in the ocean, half of it. So that is important, right? Without breathing, we are all gone, right? So oxygen is important. So there are lots of values connected to this. In fact, there are values that are non-existent by that, that is uh, a, 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 what we call existence values, where some of us say the ocean should not be there just to service. The ocean on its own has a right to be there, right? Not the existence value. So there are many, many things here. But if we focus on the food side and the job side and the economic side, it's quite substantial. So we take about 100 million tons of fish each year from the global ocean, 100 million tons. In terms of mature cows, that would turn into about 100 million mature fish cows that would pull out of the ocean each year. Just think about it. That's about, from my, the numbers I've seen, that's more than about 40, 50% more than all the cows we slaughter on our farms to feed the world. So the ocean is huge in terms of food. And it's food that is good for rich people and also poor people. There are parts of the world where people will have nothing to eat if not for, I mean, they won't have animal protein to eat if not for fish. To go to West Africa, Southeast Asia, and parts of the world. So it's very crucial that because when they come by, they all just go catch and eat. And if you are in Perth or in Vancouver and you have a good day, one of the things you do is to go to a seafood restaurant, right? It's good protein, micro is healthy. Your doctors tell you to, they will advise you to eat fish rather than beef or everything being before. So this is uh, very vital. And it employs a lot of people, really, and, and gives a lot of uh, income to people. Our estimate is that about 260 million from people around the world earn some income from ocean fisheries, 260 million. Lots of people, and when you dig into the data, this is what you see. Most of the jobs are in large developing countries where people will have nowhere to do if not for the fish. And this is, to me, this is the big service we get from the ocean, actually. Keeping tens of millions of young people, mostly young men, busy, rather than, you know, causing lots of trouble socially, you know, you know what I mean. And these troubles don't only stay in those countries, they spread. And I could give you many examples. I don't have time. So this thing, I, 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 I really, because I know what is happening. You go to West Africa, people will, lots of people will have nothing to do, and that will be a lot of pressure. Uh, and I like saying this, in 2016, I had the privilege of talking just a few, a couple of hours after President Obama had given a talk on oceans, and so I got in there. 
And I use this in a very funny way. I said, you all remember when he became president, how quickly he became gray, right? You remember that? You read it in the news. I said, if not for these jobs, he would have been grayer. And not only him, all of us in the room would be grayer because this is trouble all over, right? Think of piracy in Somalia, which is connected to overfishing and pirate fishing and so on. So, so yes, this, this is important. But as the ocean is doing all this work for us, we are not treating the ocean well. And you have it all over. Lots of trash. Whether it's fishing up my food, well, the work, that the published one of his key papers. Or you talk about we fishing, we are, we are fishing almost everywhere, like Hulk and Show, Jeremy Jackson doing historical uh, study of fishing and showing the kind of declines we have seen over time. There are lots of problems. You have oil spills, you have plastic, you have overfishing, fishing, taking the big fish and all that. So we have a lot of issues to deal with. Thinking about the blue economy, you cannot have a sustainable blue economy when these things continue, right? Yeah, you can't. So that is the kind of just standing. For the rest of the talk, I will play this interview, which I think it captures the the team and the kind of uh, uh, take I have on how to make the blue, the, the, uh, blue ocean sustainable. So um, I was taught how to do this. Let's see how many students are. So here, we're going to hear a little bit of the, not, uh, the part of it that this is uh, an interview that I gave. Managing the ocean isn't easy. We'll hear from a professor studying how to do it best in the future. Could aquaculture be good for sales of fresh wild fish? And Liberal MP turns Rogers on former fisheries minister Dominic LeBlanc's conflict of interest. I'm Jane Amy. Welcome to the broadcast. How do countries manage the seas while still meeting the needs of people? That is one of the big questions Rashid Dumela struggles with in his work. He's a professor of fisheries economics and management at the University of British Columbia. And he's in town to speak at Memorial University. According to Samela, the answer to protecting the environment and meeting human needs involves major changes in policy. That's really tough, I mean, and, and so it's, it's, it's the ideas that policies we put up and the actions we take can either give positive, positive feedback from people to nature and nature to people, or we may end up with a negative feedback. And, and so in designing these policies, we really have to have this in mind, say that we make sure we put in place policies and management systems that lead to positive feedback where people get benefits and that leads to them thinking more about the conservation and trying to conserve. And because you conserve more, you get more benefits and, and so on and so forth, rather than the opposite way people are in dear need where, where a few people run off with all the benefits and leave the bulk of the people, which means that you have to hang on the last fish, right, if you need food, and that then leads to a negative feedback to nature. So how do you get people, though, to adopt a conservationist attitude when they are struggling uh, financially in all over coastal Canada to, to survive. How do you get people to uh, weigh the benefits of protecting the environment? Yeah, and this is you know, this question really hits at the struggle and the effort that I and others are, are placing. For example, let's take uh, fishery subsidies. It's, it's an instrument that our governments use both in Canada and around the world to somehow support the community or the fishing sector for all sorts of reasons, it can be social and, and other reasons. But the way you do that can lead to increasing poverty and need, which then, which is partly why we are where we are now. And therefore, like your question is, is alluding to, uh, therefore there's pressure to, to take the fish. And, and, so, and so the way we do that, the subsidy. What I'm saying is when we analyze the, the amount of subsidies being given by governments around the world, we came up with an estimate of $35 billion a year that governments around the world give to the fishing sector. Now, when we 
we look at the distribution of that between large scale industrial and small scale fisheries, 84% of our estimated 25 billion goes to large scale fisheries. Only about 16% goes to small scale. And there are more small scale fishes in the world by far than large scale fishes. And they are those who are really at the coast of scratching for survival, right? So, and then we use our policy to aggravate these problems because it makes them less viable, less competitive in the market, and in catching the fish. And so that is the kind of negative feedback that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about and trying to alert us so we avoid them. So going forward, what, what are your suggestions? So number one, uh, if we take it for continuing on the subsidies uh, trend, number one is that the way we, we should we should in our giving of subsidies, and I'm not saying don't, don't get money into the communities that are also so present, but what we do that number one, we give them what we call so called good subsidies. Subsidies that don't lead to overfishing and overcapacity. So subsidies for example, the Europeans have this idea which I think is neat. They say we, we pay coastal fishing communities to catch plastic rather than catch fish. Huh? Yeah. So here you use the taxpayers' money to support fishers so they get their livelihoods, which we all want. At the same time, they go clean the ocean of plastic so the fish is left alone and they have a cleaner environment. And so we have a win-win-win. Uh -huh. These are the kind of clever ways we can actually get to help people and also keep nature sustainable. And that was Rashi Sumela, a professor of fishery economics and management at the University of Britain. Oh, okay. She was going to say I'm going to give a talk in Newfoundland uh, uh, this, this evening, which is not true, right? I'm here now, so, so that, is, that is that. So this is the kind of theme that will keep coming up as we go through here. So very good. So we got that. So what I'm going to do now is to use, like I said, climate change and <coughs> fishery subsidies, life scale protection to, to push this argument further. And at the end, I show this video which expands what I'm talking about to other aspects that I'm not able to talk about at the time available. So climate change, I think climate change at the moment is intensifying negative feedback, which is exactly what we don't want. So if you want to have a blue economy, we have to shut down the, the greenhouse gases. If we keep pumping out greenhouse gases, forget the blue economy. So that is one big condition for achieving this. And that's a tall order, right? But that is what uh, we need to do. And why do I say that? We know that the, 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 the surface of the water is warming as we have more global warming and climate change. So this tells you very quickly the, the more reddish, yellowish, and reddish it is, the, the higher the average temperature now compared to the long term temperature, right? long term climate, really. So, so that's what you can see it's warming. Even though we've had a very cold winter in, 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 in the north, it's, the trend is still clear, right? There's a president who actually tweeted about this saying, we well, have so much also climate change is warm. You know, it doesn't work that easily. The difference between climate and, and temperature. So this is increasing. We have the warming, sea level rise is building up, more ocean acidification is taking place, less oxygen in parts of the ocean, dead zones are increasing. So lots of stresses on the ocean taking place. And the science is telling us that all this can will affect, in fact. If you have all the biophysics changing the way they've said, then you know that life in the ocean will be impacted. And, and if the fish is impacted in terms of biomass, what is available to catch will also be impacted. It just goes on like that. You can almost draw a line linking all these changes. And this is what we, we did in, in this paper, where we look at all the things that we are told by physicists, oceanographers, and so on, that's happening with the chemistry and the physics of the ocean. And that clearly feeds and goes into the ocean and affects organism populations of, of animals and biodiversity and all that and at the end of the day it's gonna go right into your fisheries economics. 
So I'm sitting there seeing scientists talking about it and say, oh my God, there's going to happen something in the buckets of people, fishes, and actually also fish consumers. So that's the, 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 the science I'm summarizing for you very quickly. And this is work done by Vigela, my former PhD student. She tried to calculate using models on the line models to tell us how much the revenues from fishing, ocean, uh, from ocean fisheries, would change at different, in looking at different scenarios of climate change. And that is what you see. It contains a lot of information. But essentially, the reddish part, that's where the catches will be affected most and the revenues will be affected most. So in the middle of the, of the uh, by, by the equity, that's where the big impacts are. And that's, uh, that's uh, there are numbers there for you to see. And this, to me, is a very important message. So the effects of climate change is not going to be uniform, right? Uh, so the north and the, the, the poles are going to, to benefit according to all the projections because fish are like people, right? When it is too hot, you want to move or do something. We can put the air condition or put the heater, depending on what the temperature is. The fish don't have that. They either move and follow the temperature or they perish, right? So, so that is what you see. Uh, so they are going to move away. And there are many things I will, I will come back and make points about this picture. And before then, let me give you more of the kind of results we are seeing. This is another paper from Wiki's thesis where she looked at West Africa, the consequences of this. Depending on the severity of the scenario we use, you see big, 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 big changes in, in the potential catches of these countries. And as you know, these countries need food probably more than any part of the world. You have a lot of issues with food. You look at big country, Nigeria, 50% of the catch currently is projected to, to, to be lost because of changing climate and so on and so forth. Very big impacts. If any of this really, if we, if this estimate are 50% right, then that is a lot of trouble for these countries. These are the places where people will not have animal protein in many coastal villages without the fish. Then I, I, I take you around the world a little bit. And what do you see here? Uh, so this one, again, coming from the paper, we did calculations for different island states in the, in, the, in the Pacific. And this is what you see, big losses. Which one is that? That's OK. New Zealand may be able to shift money to them, so maybe they will be OK. 70%. But there are island states that will really be worth. According to our estimate, the average loss in global revenue is about 10.4%. Whereas for some of these countries, it's well over 50 and very high. So again, the impacts are going to be on tropical developing countries. And but that monopoly there, this is an example from Canada. We, we did some modeling work. And here, too, you see there are uh, different. If it's blue, that means you're going to see more fish. If it's red, you're losing more fish. And this is what we, we are finding out. And what I showed this in Newfoundland, they actually told me they already see movement, fishing, fishing companies and families actually moving in that blue area. They, they evidence that there's actually fish moving that way. So this has a lot of implications for management, right? And, and also politics. So the question I ask, even in Canada, is it easy for somebody to just move from one coastal village to another to fish just like that? That doesn't happen easily, so there are management implications <coughs> here that uh, we need to take into account. Then there's this paper where, where the authors, and I'm not one of the authors here, where they looked at the fish that the indigenous people in Canada actually consume a lot and estimated the impact of climate change on that. Uh, and it's huge, and this is a big thing in, in Canada because in the, in the Fisheries Act of Canada, we have three key objectives of the fisheries, the way Canadians want their fisheries to be managed. One is that you should manage it for sustainability, so conservation is no more. And the scientists say this stock, zero quota because the fish is not in trouble, 
if they follow the rules properly, they will put zero quota. Okay. And the second priority is fish, uh, food, and social and ceremonial services of indigenous Canadians. They get second priority. You have to meet their needs before you open this up for commercial fishes and so on. So, and we are seeing this kind of thing happening with climate change, huge uh, management issue. And you can show this in different countries. If I had this done for Australia, I'm sure we'll see something similar. So, and each of these, whether it's West Africa, whether it's First Nations in Canada and other places, or whether it is Pacific Island states, we see the same trend. The countries that do not generate or pump up CO2 per capita by much are those going to be hit by the most, right? And this is then a moral and ethical question for all of us in the North. Right? We do the pumping, they do the paying of the cost, right? And you can say, oh, this is not a problem, I don't care. Even if you don't care, you still have a reason to care because if you look at Europe, a lot of the forced migration from West Africa, people have actually nailed it back to the losses in their fish resources. So people don't just sit down and die when they don't have food, right? People move, and so this is a possible. And sometimes even a war cannot stop people, right? So, so, so in our own in the interest of the world, I think this is something we need to really have in mind as we put in place policies and, and actions to deal with the blue economy, making sure people don't go completely kaput. So that is a very summarized on climate change, making the point. At the moment, the pumping of CO2 is leading to negative feedback. Many people are being affected, will be affected more. And then they are going to hang on the last fish or the last three or whatever. As we are talking about, agriculture is also impacted. And so you cannot have a blue economy without dealing with the climate issue. And that is a big challenge. Now, we go to fisheries subsidies. And I say subsidies fuel negative feedbacks. And you heard a bit of that in the, in the, in the radio interview. And essentially, the subsidy is either government giving the fishery sector directly. Sometimes they write checks for people. In the US, we actually track checks being paid subsidy to fishing companies. Or they give you a fuel subsidy. Everybody pays something, and you pay less than that through the tax. Whatever you get an advantage, that is a, a fishery subsidy. And like I, you heard in the video, this is the theory behind why economists don't like this. And, and even fishery biologies. Essentially, if somebody is paying part of your cost of fishing, you are going to fish more than you would if you operated under the market system. Okay? So, and remember, the market system is not good enough because of the common property nature of our fishery. There's always this competition. The fish is not yours until it's in your boat, right? Except you have a good management system. So without any subsidies, we are already in trouble. You end up there. But with subsidies, it gets worse. And fuel is the, is, the, is the big one here. Fuel subsidies, you can see. When, when oil prices were going up, many boats in Malaysia tied, they couldn't go fishing. Then there was a big demonstration. And then the government came with money to pay for some of the fuel. The next day, they all went. So you just see it. I mean, this is not uh, a joke. It's not just theory. It's real life. So that is why. But by the way, I have to say, not all subsidies are bad. And some subsidies that can be good. Like if you if you pay to monitor and make sure people obey the rules that you set for fishing, then it's a good thing. You're helping to sustain your fishery. But if you pay for fuel, then you need to overfishing. So there are ways you can spend money in communities without killing the fish. And that is what we are seeking to deal with this. We started in the early 2000s building a, a database, and we did this classification to see beneficial fish subsidies, harmful ones. And there are those that you cannot easily put in a box, like buyback subsidies, where you say there are too many boats. That means is we cannot force people out there, we can pay them to sell their boats and get out of the fish. So that we have to plan it well for it to work, otherwise, it's wasted. 
So there's this classification to help, to help us uh, map it up. Then we have the database, which we always try to improve at the moment. Our estimate is for 2009. And there's a big need to really update this to bring it close because the WTO is actually negotiating now, trying to discipline subsidies, bring rules across the globe that restricts the giving of so called back subsidies. And because otherwise, some countries do, others don't, then you become less competitive. So that is that. And, and then we took this further and did the division. This is another of my PhD students, Anna Shoba. What we did was to take each country and say how much of the subsidy you give goes to small scale versus how much goes to large scale. And it's a whole uh, big effort here. He did reports like crazy. This I told her now when she was doing this, this is your failed one, right? This is like going out and counting fish in the ocean, except that you read a lot of reports to try to tease them why this money is going. And when we did that, Already you had that 35 billion is the total. Our estimate is that 57% of that is all bad subsidies. That's what you see in the middle. So we, we, we do that, and depending on developing developed countries, you see the picture. And this is the big, big exhibit from Anna's thesis, where, where we took the 35 billion, and you see that 84% goes to the light scale, and not the 16. I decided to do this because I went into a big argument with the speaker, the then speaker of the House of Assembly of Indonesia and the British House of Lords. I gave a talk about this for G20 countries. And he went after me like crazy. He said, Rishi, we are going to continue giving subsidies. And I said, why? He said, why would you do that? Because we want to help the poor. We want to help them. At the time, I didn't have this data. So I, all that I can say is, if you want a foot soldier to fight poverty, you can come for me. That's what my life is about. But giving people subsidies to kill the, 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 the fish that feeds them is not the way to do it. That's for every country. And then when you look further, the small scale fisheries, 14%, 41% of what they get are classified as bad. You know, about 60% are good or unusual. Whilst in this case, 60% of what they get in the life scale are, are bad fuel. So trawlers, big trawlers, use a lot of fuel so they get the fuel subsidy more by, by, by nature. And that is another. So if we take out all the bad subsidies, the life scale would be affected more. And that would actually uh, help the, the small scale fishers make them more competitive. And then, you know, might help actually the positive feedback. So you don't give subsidies, and if you do, make sure they're good ones and don't disadvantage the small scale fishers because you're just making the world more uneven, uneven in terms of incomes. All right, now let's go to the large scale uh, ocean protection. That is marine protected areas in, in, in the main, and I'm going to use the high seas as an example. These are the reasons why an economist like me support protecting part of the ocean. Number one is like buying insurance. Because no matter how good we are, there's still a lot we don't know about the ocean. Whether it's the physics or the, the, the ecology and the human side, there are uncertainties. So usually when you don't have full information, you buy insurance, right? That's why you have house insurance. And, and, you, and when you buy your house insurance, you don't sit down praying for fire to catch the house. You, you pay the insurance just in case it happens. So you are not paying insurance to make money, really, not for, for a house or whatever, even life insurance. You don't sit down and say, OK, I'm paying insurance. I want to go today. Huh? No, no. <laughs> you do so. so sometimes when we do MPAs, people are saying, what are the benefits? No, it's insurance so that if we mess up, the way we fish, at least we have part of the ocean that can help us come back. Uh, investment analysts do this a lot. That's why you don't put all your money in one basket, right? You have to, you have to diversify. The crucial values where that has been shown again and again, where if you protect larger amounts, they're good. You get more recreational values. We're watching, for example. Then there is the fisheries benefit. Usually, the challenge there is in the short term, you lose some fishing because you are closer. But actually, in the long term, this catches up. 
very quickly because fish get concentrated and they move. And people love show here and then uh, the benefits long term can be high. And there's a common value of fish, right? Yeah, and I could talk about each of these for long, but we don't have all the time. And then there's the idea of option value. Somebody came to me and said, why do you care about sustainable fisheries? Maybe in the future generation would like to eat jellyfish. Huh? Somebody did that to me, which is very nice, self-service. So we eat all the tuna and leave jellyfish for them. I said, how about giving them the option to decide, right? Why take away that option? So that's option value in a sense. Climate resilience, people are coming up showing that uh, MPAs can help you buffer, buffer you against. Uh, and then there's equity, actually. If you do it well, that can actually help them. I'll show sure that in the quick example I'm going to show you about the ISIS. So there are many reasons to want to protect part of your ocean. You know? And, and um, that's why the world has agreed to do this, actually. 10% by 2020. How is Australia doing? Terribly. Oh my God. We got out of 30%, actually, here we go. Terribly. So, what do we do? We write a petition after this and send it to somebody. Yeah. yeah so, so that, now this is our global ocean. And many of us argue that this global ocean is actually one ocean because there's connections all over. We divide the ocean into Atlantic Pacific to make it convenient and it's nice for us to put this in our head. And we divide EEZs, country waters and the ices. The fish don't know this really. They don't know fish go where they go, right? And they don't need visa. They don't need visa to come. How to apply for visa electronically to come here. Fish just come, right? Uh, so Mexican fish they go, American fish they go. So and what you do in one part of the ocean actually can affect what happens in your country waters. This is what led uh, Secretary John Kerry to create the, our ocean Commission. He says this is a, a foreign minister, minister's responsibility because the ocean, uh, whether that we manage our oceans properly doesn't mean the ocean will do well if the next country is not doing it. So we have to bring foreign secretaries to work together and, and, and it has been going on now for, for years. So that is, this has been driving our thinking, our group and others. And this particular pie chart was uh, very uh, telling what we did. What we did was to take the whole global catch and say how much of this comes from fish that live all their lives only in the high seas and how many of them live all their lives in country waters and how many of them struggle between the two. And that's the pie chart. The catch, almost nothing in the value of fish that live only all their lives in the high seas. We call them orphans of the ocean. So a lot of them are actually, they go in and out. So when I did this pie chart, that led us to start thinking, maybe if you close the high seas to fishes, it will be that bad. Because that's the only thing we lose, 0.1, 0.1 of value, right? You can give that away. You can even be an error term, could be zero. So you could do that, and you catch those that are always in the, your country waters, and then you can wait for the fish to come in, and you catch them. And these areas are better managed, and you spend less to catch the fish. Because remember, only about 5% of the total global catch comes from the high sea. It's not very concentrated with fish. Most of the fish is in the continental shelf. And that is two thirds of the ocean. So just think of the basic economics. You catch 5% in two thirds of the ocean. The fuel and the cost of doing that is high. So this is what led us to start thinking, maybe it might pay to just close it down. Thing. And whilst we're thinking, there's another group in California, Chris Costello's group, they were also thinking and doing modeling with them. And both of our works that led to us saying, close the highest institution or asking the question, is simply captured by this simple uh, animation. So you have your ocean, you block this, that's a high sea here, and that's where you could come through waters. So let's say you are brave enough to close that part of the ocean. The whole theory is that when the fish get there, they have bees, they can grow, they can lay eggs or whatever, and that then gets transferred into the ocean. That is a, the theory at least. 
And so what will happen over time, you end up having more fish than you would have if you were catching all over the place. And fish are like people, but if it starts getting crowded, some of them will say, no, 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 this is too much for me. So let me do something. Aha. Just jump over and then come into uh, the ocean. So you have that. And finally, there are many enough that you jump on your boat. You don't need to go look for them, right? So it can be really cheap to catch this when it comes to water. So that is underlying this uh, kind of thinking. And we've been pushing it. Uh, people think we're crazy, but it's slowly catching fire, actually. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Before John Kerry left office, he started talking about this. Uh, and other leaders are talking. And in fact, we got the first large high seas marine protected areas declared in Antarctica, the Ross Sea. Not close, the countries are agree. So that's the beauty of being a, a researcher. You find something, you just throw it out and go, go just leave it there, let it start simmering, right? And somebody, the more evidence you pile, hopefully the world will start to take its leaves. And another thing we did in this paper, which was very interesting, is to calculate what economists call the Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient is a quick way of determining how, how the distribution of income in a country is. So each country has a number that is calculated, and it runs from zero to one. So if you have zero, what does that mean? That means you are on this 45 degree line. Zero is the perfect distribution. 1% of the population get 1% of the income, 50% get 50%, 100% get 100%. Equal distribution poor. If you have, on the other hand, an area of one, that means one person in the place takes everything. Most of the world is in the middle, it's inside there. So we calculated the distribution of revenues on the high seas, given the current situation, and if you were to close the high seas. And that was quite surprising. So we, we, it dropped from 0.66 to 0.33, the Gini coefficient. Why? Because five countries, five large countries, think about Korea, Taiwan, China, Japan, I think Spain, they take about 70% of the total of them because they're the only ones who actually fish them. So, so you, you see that, and that part of the ocean is actually considered owned by all the world, the world citizens. So if you close the high seas, the fish will move in, and small countries too can get to catch it when they can. That is what changes this equation. So by closing the high seas, you move the distribution of revenues from the high seas from the distribution of South Africa, which is the most unequal country in the world in terms of income. And you all know the reason, right? Apartheid. And then you turn it into that of Sweden, which is the, one of the most equally distributed or more with less uh, uh, gap between incomes and people. So which one do you want? Do you want South African income distribution or the Swedish one? Yeah. So that is another message that came from my paper, which got a lot of traction. Might as well have to tell you. That is, this is a new paper we did, and, and I think, yeah. Dirk is on this paper, yeah. So it's kind of a collaboration between a new group in California called the Global Fish Fishing, Fishing World. And, and uh, uh, right? Yeah. And then our group, the CRNS Fisheries Economic Research Unit. And actually, the group here, right, because we use the slave uh, index, slave data. Slave. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if we used it in there. Yeah, we approximated. But the thinking was, was yeah, part thinking of it. So what we calculated here, if you look at the first thing there, we just look at the revenues from different parts of the, of the ocean, mainly the high seas. So you see this all blue. This is because we are not taking into account the cost of fishing. So it's just a revenue. So everyone who fishes there gets some revenue they catch fish. So that's what you see. Here we calculated the real profit to them. If you take the full cost of fishing there, you see, it's changed a lot. It's a lot already in fact 54% of the fishing areas will not be profitable if not for subsidies. So we took subsidies into account and we took into account the low 
salaries and wages they pay people, which is slave labor in the essential. Many of the boats actually pay virtually nothing and uh, under very bad conditions. So they're uh, being subsidized by your tax money and also by poor people who have no option, right? So they ride on your back. And that is also something we need to, if you deal with that, then you need to deal with this to have any sustainable blue economy that is inclusive, that really takes care of people rather than a few people running away with all of them. So now we have come to my quick run through the big three topics. We do have time, I hope, and then we watch this, and that will then come back and have a few questions. This is a video that uh, should actually give you a bit more about the scope of things uh, I've been doing now. Where is that? That is not one. Uh, that's this one. So I'll sit quietly and do that. of the surface of the planet were once seen as an infinite supply source for humans to use. But the oceans are under strong pressure. Scientific data from Rashid Sumaila and other researchers show that the global fish catch has stalled and is now falling, despite increased efforts from fishing fleets all over the world. There is less and less fish to catch. The research of this year's laureate shows us how imminent and devastating the threats are to fish and marine life. But he also has solutions. If we make the high stakes and fish back over, we'll get these benefits ecologically, economically, and also social. Beautiful idea. For years, researchers here have been compiling data and statistics on global fish catch. What they have found is that official statistics don't add up. There is more fish caught than officially reported. So our group led by Daniel Pauli have been spending time trying to re-estimate and get us as close to the true catch as possible. Globally, we are seeing that actually the official data is about 50% off. The first reaction is, but it doesn't correspond to the official catch. But the official catch doesn't correspond to reality. The global fish catch in the world from 1950 to 2010 was 3.6 million metric tons, reported officially. But when the researchers at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries took into account all fishing, recreational, illegal, local not reported fishing and more, they came up with a much higher figure, 5.4 billion metric tons, that is 50% higher than the official figures. Stepston was once a bustling fishing village. Nowadays, the fishing boats spend most time in port since their fishing quotas are quickly filled. It's very slow here compared to what it used to be historically. Randy Pilford has been a fisherman all his life, but now his fishing vessel, Kilvada, is mostly moored at the Cape side. It was a really good lifestyle when I was younger. You think there's still a lot of fish out there? I'm not sure about that anymore. It's got worse every year. 
What would you say to a um, young man? Would you say go into the fishing industry? No. 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 Marine life has taken a devastating hit in the last 40 years. A recent study from the Worldwide Fund for Nature indicates a nearly 50% decline in marine life populations between 1970 and 2012. But overfishing and overexploitation of marine resources aren't the only threats to the oceans. There are several million tons of plastics entering the oceans every year. If we don't do something to stop this, in the next few decades there might be more plastic in the ocean than fish, which is quite scary. I mean, and this plastic they, they break into little pieces, microplastic. The fish see them and they think it's algae. They eat them, it pollutes them, and also actually can pollute people. Related to pollution is climate change, which is responsible for change in the oceans more rapidly than at any other point in recorded history. We can see that there's a general decline in both of the catch and the revenue in the, along the tropical region. When the temperature is getting warmer, this habitat is not suitable for them anymore. A slight rise in temperature will change ocean currents and also disrupt the ocean's food chain. Every animal, like people, we have a comfortable range of temperature. Uh, when it's too hot, me and you, we can put on the air conditioning. Or if it is too cold, we put on the heat, and the fish don't have that. They either have to move and follow the temperature, or if they can, they perish. One of Rashid Samila's suggestions has been to ban fishing altogether on the so-called high seas. These are the unregulated areas covering two-thirds of the oceans. The high seas are owned by everyone and no one, which means they're up for grabs and undefended. We we'll make the high seas the fish bundle where the fish can hide and grow, that will even make the biodiversity improve, that will make the economics improve, because instead of going into the high seas and burning carbon and spending a lot of money to catch the fish, the fish can't be put in the easy, so it's cheaper to catch. The idea to ban fishing in the high seas was originally seen as totally unrealistic. People thought I was crazy, really. But, but now people are saying, hey, maybe this is a wise thing. For the same reason that you don't open your savings account to all kinds of expenditures, and the more you think about it, the more you like it. There is now a growing support for protection of the high seas. And the first high seas marine protected area, the Ross Sea in Antarctica, has recently come into force. New technology, which makes it possible to track down fish virtually everywhere, can also be a main tool for monitoring and help in creating sustainable fisheries. This is amazing stuff. Every fishing boat that has a tracker in the world, you can actually look for individual vessels here. This is gonna be the future of surveillance, at least in the high seas. This exists now. Just a few words. Okay. Another of Rashid Sumaila's research areas is subsidies to fishing fleets. <laughs> Many governments around the world give subsidies to the fishery sector with good intentions, but a lot of these subsidies actually lead to overfishing. So one of the things you want to do, don't give subsidies that lead to overcapacity and overfishing. In many parts of the world, there's a lot of illegal fishing going on. You need to have a system that changes the economic equation, say that it doesn't pay to fish illegal. For more than 20 years now, Rashid Samaila has worked relentlessly with research on the future of the oceans. Perhaps an unexpected career for a boy growing up in a Taylor family in the Nigerian countryside. Everything started with my daddy, who was quite progressive. I said, you know what? Go do whatever you really have passion for and do it very well. Even if it is cleaning gutter, once you, you do it well, they will look for you. So that, that thing was really powerful to me. It kind of liberated me. So for graduate school, I decided I would do economics because I was free to do anything. He studies to go to Norway, where the fishing industry has always been important in the economy, and led to a doctorate in fisheries economics. So that was how I got into fisheries, and since then, I've done fisheries all through. The oceans are amazing, that is where most of life is, balancing the climate and, and giving us lots of food, but at the same time, it was facing a lot of threats to something that is so valuable 
to people and that is really keeping me busy, keeping me passionate. How can we get solutions to keep this amazing natural system that we have going sustainably, not only for us, but also for future generations? Actually, is one of the stars. He can actually pass very complicated issues in very simple terms to the public, and that completely captivates me. You should see him giving lectures. He's an incredible orator. You can see that the passion drives him. He's camera friendly. I think collaborate very effectively. People, people want to work with him. Change my life. You know, to have such a positive person in your corner all the time. We are incredibly proud of him as one of our most eminent scientists. We can do it. We can sustain that ocean. The threat to the oceans eventually comes down to our relation to them. The oceans are our lives. This is where life on the planet began. Most people love to be close to water and to the oceans. And we now need to understand how intertwined we as humans are to all the marine life. All right, so then I, I just have this slide back. Let's go out and seek positive feedback between people and the ocean, between fish and people. Otherwise, we are in deep trouble. The oceans are our lives. And the ocean doesn't care, really. Uh, we do as if the environment cares about us, right? Uh, if, if, if things go wild, well, it's we who suffer. What does the ocean know, right? So let's get going. Let's get going. Thank you so much for your attention. And it's time for questions. I have uh, some positive things here. There's a lot going on in the world. People recognizing this, and we have international agreements, varieties of IG targets, sustainable development goals, or climate change issues, the Paris Agreement, and the WTO is negotiating now to try to fix the subsidies problem. And the high seas are being there's a, an ongoing uh, UN, UN negotiation going on now. And I'm really happy we're putting some of us are putting pressure. So I'm sure they are thinking we've got to do a good job, otherwise crazy people like X, Y, Z will want to close the high seas. So if that alone leads to more action, that will be nice. Thank you very much for attention. Yes, yes. Um, I'm Martin Exon from Austral Fisheries, uh, a, a fishing company here, and very much make the ocean part of my life. So first off, I'd like to thank you not just for your talk, but your passion and your drive over the last 35, 40 years in the marine space. We are the only carbon neutral seafood business in the world. And my question to you um, is, what economic positive reinforcement can you give us to help people understand the need to deal with the climate change impacts? Mm -hmm. It's one thing for us to be the crazies like you out the front, yeah. it's another thing altogether mm -hmm. for everybody to start doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. where did you get that positive economic reinforcement? From the economics, actually, yeah. So that's, that's a good question. And you know what? I wish you asked me this question next week. What is it with the sun? We actually have a paper coming out on the 27th. In science advances, I'm not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> but in there, we did things really trying to get people to wake up to this. And one of the things we did was to calculate what climate change is likely to do to your budget for fish, seafood in your household. Well, climate change, if you insist on eating the same quantity of fish and the same quality, is going to cost you billion dollars around the world. So, so we calculated the last one of the things we are bringing just to bring the message into people's pockets. It usually, it works. So, 27, there will be more on this. Thank you. Um, I know I kind of like apologize for your talking about the economics. Is there Patterns that you've seen that are creating greater 
because of the temperature range changes greater fisheries or is it all less? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, the, the thing is we see some areas we gain fish and this is not even because of productivity but because the fish are moving. So, so you have the movement effect. For example, people in Norway and Iceland and Greenland, they are smiling. Because if they're just thinking about fish, the fish are coming. So we see that, yeah. And new fisheries can emerge actually out of that. Even in the waters of BC, we see fish that are really seen more moving up. So that, that is. But then, you know, you have good news and sometimes bad news too. Because ocean acidification, you know, the active is one of the hot spots for ocean acidification. So yes, the fish will go to Iceland and Norway, but they may be moving from boiling water into acidic water. So there you go, right? When you think of that, it is complicated. But yes, some places will see new species and actually do work. Do you see species change happening huh? with time? With time? Yeah. Do you see species adapting quickly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They move in. They move. Uh, I know they're moving there. But adaptation. adaptation uh, is that. You know what? We haven't seen much of adaptation because that is a bit slow. Can be. Yeah, it can be. Some can do it. But in general, adaptation, you know, before fish really changes behavior, it needs a bit of time. But some fishes do. Yes, please. Do you have any commentary on the extended continental shelf claims around mm. the world, and particularly in the Indian Ocean? We've got giant claims and lots of countries pushing it as a blue economy yeah. issue. So the blue economy actually is a concept that has different meaning for different people. And further is the, the economist is big on this pushing this term. And when you look at the underlying philosophy, it's like we have a new frontier going to make money, tons of money, right? I think we're just discovering the portion yesterday. <laughs> and the thing is, we're already there, and there's a lot of activity, so, so, so yes. And countries, some countries are saying, with the highest of the problem, the solution is just to extend the exclusive economic zone, country waters from 200 nautical miles to 350, some of them. Brazil is one of them. Australia. Australia. Ah. So there is this argument at the UN people again. We'll see where that goes, but it could lead to even more problems. So there's less high seas. Yeah, there's less high seas, and there will be loss of insecting eases also, right? Because you then have moving. So that is that is the debate. And people are saying, why not just extend and then we eliminate the high seas and then countries then take care of the world. It's part of the discussion. It's going to be tough to get through for all sorts of reasons. But hey, nothing is impossible. Just like those in the high seas, right? Yeah. If enough people in the world want to do one thing or the other, we usually get it done. Yeah. It's all about we. I think. Yeah. And sometimes there's a dictator there, and you think it's impossible because of that, and they come and go, right? Hopefully. <laughs> I'm being too po 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 positive here. Okay. That's what makes me go. Uh huh. Yes, please. And then you. Okay. I was just wondering if the high seas are only the only that has a standard of catch, when the catch comes from the high seas, how much um, difference will it really make to protect them? You yeah. know, the fish population, how much difference that will That's beautiful. That's a good question. Huh? The reason there is that. The reason is because there's a lot of them that go in and out. So, so if they, once they are in there, if they get some peace from us, then the chances are that they're going to, and actually, you talk about adaptation, there is an evolutionary paper that Daniel and Sarah Otto, one of our best evolutionary biologists at UPC, they did what they actually have shown that if you close an area, with time, the fish actually realize that. That place is a safe zone. So when they go there, they become lazy. They want to remain there forever, right? Yeah, they just stay there. So that's the, the, the kind of thing. And, and those kind of behaviors are what leads to the boost, essentially. 
And then you have the economic side. A lot of it comes from the economic side also, because then it's cheaper to catch as a main point. And the third factor is from the management side. At the moment, that is really poorly managed because of the com uh, competition. And if you manage it better, you get a better impact on the system. Yes, I told you were going to talk. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you, Rashid, for a very interesting presentation. As biologists, as well as people listen to economists, and well. Mm -hmm. And you asked about how Australia is doing on the current practice. Yes, please. And as an economist, I'd be interested in your views on the relative cost associated with partial <coughs> which is two thirds of our main park system versus mm -hmm. full protection. Mm -hmm. Partial protection. You know, the, we, we're doing this, we're trying to do a special issue exactly on that, actually. Maybe you can join me with this, because I know you are thinking a lot about it. Uh, and we are now very worried about the quality of the protection that is given. Countries are very good, they just sign paper parks and, uh, uh, or paper tigers. You've heard that, that expression before, paper tiger? Yeah. That's a tiger that will never bite you, right? <laughs> so, so they do that. So we are beginning to say, look here, it's not enough just to say up that. You have to make sure there's enforcement. And the, the tighter, if you have a completely close area, it's more effective than partial. Because, and the example like I gave, and I think Daniel also gives this, is, you know, if you come to Vancouver, we have a Vancouver, uh, what we call Stanley Park. How many people have been to Vancouver here? Have you been to Stanley Park? Think, a, think of King's Park. Yeah, yeah. A, the King's Park, which is... Lush. Yeah. Oh, Lush. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So this is, this is such a beauty for the city. Within a few minutes, we are in the park, and it's really wonderful. And, and the, the thing we talk about, partial protection, you see all the lushness and the trees, that is because you are not allowed to take anything out of it. They don't allow it. And I believe if you allow people to go in with little knives even, to catch a little bit, to take a little bit of those trees, it's just a question of time before they are all gone. So partial protection usually doesn't do much. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be a bit cool here. You know, I think, I gave a talk at the World Ocean, uh, our ocean Conference in Malta. Uh, and I talked with Jessica before, on the phone, phone or on email. And so I gave a talk about the quality of MDS, and I ended up by asking them, am I allowed to say this for you? Is that OK? As a scientist, I should be able to say anything, right? <laughs> so I said, you guys really get the picture of what I'm saying of what value is a pet condom to you, <laughs> Please, I didn't say put it off. But that was how I, I, and this was amazing. I mean, I said this, the room just exploded because everybody got the message. And then I'm out at the conference, I'm walking, they said, oh, shit, we were not at your top, but we had it. I said, oh my gosh, you know. It really looks like wildfire. So yeah, to, for this to work, you really have to be serious and make sure it's well protected. Quality of protection is crucial, right? Otherwise, yes. And uh, you and the U.S. Treaty House is wonderful. Just to throw up, so just to put it down with that, you just told us how quality of protection is important. So if we close the high seas. How do we assume that there's going to be a high quality of protection there, considering that the vast majority of the world's going to be able to parks at the moment? This is, this is a great question, and I get it a lot. And while I want to be naughty, and sometimes, you know, it's part of the fun, uh, this should be fun, right, when you, you give a talk. So I say, you know what, bro, I don't know. What do I know? I just did my little research and I just found that. If we did it, it will be good, right? Biologically, economically. I leave it to more brilliant minds to find how to actually do <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, but actually, that is closer to the truth. I mean, this is why you do it. You throw it out, and we see some, and you get solutions. But more seriously, I, I really believe technology can help us a lot. 
all the satellite technology and, and so on. And there are people in Silicon Valley who want to have, you know, two weeks ago I was in Stanford and we were talking about how can technology help small scale issues. So big players are really looking at this. And uh, they said, how can we help you with sustainability? They said, you know what? Create an app that counts all the fish in the ocean. Wouldn't that be nice? They just count the fish for us. And that will take half of our problems away. Talk assessment, they miss like every estimation thing. So technology could help. And also, if you close the whole high seas, it could actually be easier to monitor and control. Because if you see a fishing boat there, it's over, no discussion. What are you doing there, right? So that might also be there. It's not impossible. It's good. Yes. Uh -huh. I have a question about the map from, I think it was Vicky's paper. Yes. So we've got West Africa and there's a lot of negative impacts. Yeah. On the larger map, Morocco doesn't seem to have any negative impacts. Oh, yeah. Spain above does and Portuguese well as well. What, what's going on there? That's a very good, she's a very, she's attended my class. <laughs> she has a very difficult question. <laughs> Which is a good thing, well done, that is great. So, so you saw already there is a difference between the two. And the reason we did the latest one is that the satellite data actually allowed us to do a better job. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because you know the satellite data we were able to really match number of balls with the catch and, and better than we did. So it's all approximation, okay? And this is really important for young scholars to realize that life is just approximations and to, uh, forever. How do you, you, you never get to 100%. So, so we were just building up. In fact, the next paper may show something else that is within the range of science. Does that help you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you so well now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. I used to do that. I, I, I was in second year university, and uh, you know, actually, I started as an engineer, as a building technologist. Should be building things like this, but I found them so boring, right? so I don't think about it. And our professor did lots of maths to sh try to pick up a point on the map. So he did the maths and he proved it and said, This is a point. And I was sitting there looking and said, Sir, Professor Field, I said, I don't think you really hit the map. I can see that your maths didn't really close it up. And he said, uh, actually, you are right, but remember this as you grow up. Nobody ever hits the mark exactly. And that has really helped me to be a scientist. My colleagues are waiting to hit the mark exactly. They will do it forever. I've done three papers by then. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yes, you were there, and yeah, that's good. Yeah. Go ahead, please. specifically, no one has done that study to, to find out. But we have done work on rebuilding fisheries, which is quite similar, right? So if a fishery is depleted and you say, we're losing too much, we, we need to rebuild, the question is how long will it take to rebuild? So in a way, it's similar. And our global paper, which we published in 2012, we actually showed that by year eight, you are out of the negative. If you cut fishing effort by the eighth year globally, I mean, some fish come from earlier than others, you start seeing a positive benefit. So that is one indicator. But we need to do that for the high seas. And that will need more precision, more research. Yes, yeah. yeah thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but my question like back to the five percent of the cash that is made comes from the high seas. Is that in um, mass or is that an estimate of kind of like the actual is five percent of the revenue of all fisheries? 
Yeah. Yeah. So the five percent is the physical weight, is the tons of fish, you know. And I, 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 I think the value is higher than that. Yeah, it's about eight. But you're talking, yeah. it's a land value is about eight percent. Yeah, because because you're talking about tunas and so on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. highly migratory fish. But years ago, we used to catch all the tutors within the country waters. <laughs> yeah. They come in and they come pick them up. Okay. I have a couple of questions about IT closure. Um, the first one is the <coughs> IT is not owned by any certain country. So who decides any closure or that kind of policy? Mm -hmm. Is it UN or any kind of international agency? Yeah. Why Antarctica? I guess it has to start from somewhere. Yes. One of the slides shows with the warm-up, with the fisheries in Haiti, and there was not much going on in Antarctica. Yes. So why did they decide? And that's the answer to your question. <laughs> 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 uh, really, it's easier to close a place where they are not there in their face. There's no activity. And countries have actually used their strategy, that strategy a lot. The U.S. has done it, they close large areas because there's no fishing interest to fight it. So you, the MPA goes there before, and then that actually we organize ourselves around that. So that is part of the reason you see that Antarctica. But even then, it was really difficult to get it through because Russia and China were, were holding back. They were not going to approve it. It was one of the things that John Kerry and Obama managed to somehow squish it through before they left office. They managed to get Russia and I'm trying to understand how they do it. There was, there was a lady I talked to, she knew a lot more about what happened. You know, she's closer to the government all day. It's amazing the kind of games they play, right? And they managed to get him in before he took off, out of office. So, that's your, your, your first question is Antarctica is changing and people are thinking let's try to protect it before it becomes an easy. It's the same thing in the Arctic. We've actually closed part of the Arctic to fishing until we understand what is going on good enough to manage well. So the countries are signed on to that. Yeah. And your first question is uh, about... Who makes the decision about... Huh? Who makes the work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who manages that? Okay, that is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so somehow we have to get some manager for this. You know, it, it's likely to be at the UN, uh, the discussion at least. You know, like the subsidies, the world pass it on to the WTO to handle that. So there are instances where once we decide, you set up a structure to do it. You know, there is an international seabed authority which is again put together by the UN. And what they do, there's a lot of interest in going into the ocean, deep sea mining, to take minerals. So the UN agreed to create the uh, deep sea authority, is based in Jamaica, actually. And what they do is they, they supervise the giving of rights to do that. But there's also an agreement, the profit they make, some of it will be given back and put into a fund which will then be used in developing countries, you know, as a way to compensate them. So yeah, the, the world has done this before, and I think once we agree, we'll set up something to do it. Optimistic again, huh? So maybe we can take one more question, and then I think we should wrap it up. Is there one more question? Let's take in the last one. No, oh, perfect, that's the time. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> no, much. you're done. <laughs> Oh, you did um, that. Uh, <laughs> please, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I'm from Taiwan. Taiwan. I yeah. know there's a lot of like, illegal fishing going on. And I have uh, listened to another professor. He's been studying, uh, like you said, a fish bank. And he tried to educate the, the fishermen there a lot. But um, for men, they have to leave. So um, they don't think it's possible for men to, to like, ban the, like you said, high sea and low illegal fishing. Mm -hmm. So um, my question would be, um, 
what do you think would be the best way to educate that? Yeah, to students? get the authorities in yeah, Taiwan to do they, something. Yeah. You know? All the people that involved in this ministry. Yeah. And I was in Taiwan, there was a conference of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Commission, and they asked me to talk about climate change. And I got very close with some officials. I won't give you a name, right? But they were really telling me they need big papers to be written about what is happening in Taiwan by international people. By, you know, we, Daniel did one on China, and it changed a lot, actually. So they were almost begging, you should, you guys should write a paper about what is happening here because we need pressure from outside. They actually told me this. And they say, usually, Internally, you, you hardly get a serious politician to think about the issue. But if there is a big paper dropped on them, oh my gosh, and they know the West is talking, they usually do something. So maybe, are you, what are you doing here? Marie <laughs> <laughs> Rosette, yeah. right? You want to write a paper? <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, yeah. You keep up. We have people just do a big one and give them a thing. They will go after you, but. <laughs> Welcome to the live. And then do it. And then do it. So. Okay, with that, let's wrap up. And thank you very much.